Hello and welcome to the Star Wars Universe Podcast. Today we are talking about the Clone Wars, Season 3, Episodes 4, 5, 6, and 7. We're talking about politics. We're talking about Ahsoka being the one to get sent to solve problems. We're talking about all sorts of interesting machinations among the trade routes. All that and more after this commercial break we have no control over. Welcome back. My name is Matthew. I'm your host. I'm joined, as always, for discussions of the Clone Wars by uh, Sarah and Riki Hayashi. How are you folks doing tonight? Hey, Matthew. Fantastic. We're That's ready awesome. to go. Yeah. The blockade is in place. <laughs> <laughs> blockade is in place. A completely two-dimensional blockade ready to uh, stop stop people coming in and out of the planet and uh, <laughs> force them to have discussions. I'm so glad that everyone's now upset about... The, the physics of space it's great oh I, I don't know if you listen to it but um on the the other half of this podcast when we talk about movies um we just did our review of revenge of the sith and we got into that same issue of the uh the the the, the star battle starship battles being completely two-dimensional nice. in ways that didn't make any sense um so yeah no your your your, your analysis has been uh locked in <laughs> to our our thinking here um so yeah we, we have an interesting collection of episodes here tonight um not too many overarching plot arcs, although the second and third are, are pretty connected. Um, but what's your kind of overall take on what we had here tonight? Yeah, I think these few episodes, uh, especially episode four and episode seven, highlight why I thought this was all season two. Um, we, we, you see a lot of bounty hunters. Um, but I, I don't know. I really like them. They're really fun. I'm excited to talk mm-hmm. about them. Needs more grievous. <laughs> Do you want to file a grievance oh, about that? Yeah. Oh. Well, the season started off so strong in that regard. <laughs> so much mm-hmm. grievance. And then he's just gone. Yeah. I don't know. I, I really like these episodes. I feel like we're starting to get into more of the political machinations that at least Ricky, you and I have talked about wanting more of. Um, they, they're not political machinations that make any sense necessarily, but at least they're saying interesting words. Um we we have a lot less Jedi, a lot less lightsaber swinging, which I was particularly fond of. So, yeah, some interesting stuff here. So let, let's kind of dive right in. Um, so episode forty eight, the fourth episode of season three, is called Sphere of Influence, and in this one, Chairman Papan pa, Papano, Paponida's family is kidnapped and held for ransom. Ahsoka must team up with a senator from Pantora, who Papanita is also from. Ryu Chuchuri to aid the new chairman in recovering his family before the Trade Federation can unduly influence the future of his planet. Do you want? Sorry, it's so it's pa- Papadona and then Chuchi. Papadona and then Chuchi. Okay, what? awesome. That says Papanoida. Papanoida, but don't they call him Papadon? Oh my gosh, these names are ridiculous. I also thought the planet was called Pandora for the longest time. So I think is this the same planet that had the that like colonized the place with the abominable snowman? Yeah. Okay. This is the cool. same so, person. That's why that's why they're friends. Right? Oh, Chuchi? okay. Yeah. She knows that's her. right. Yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. Does yeah, it? I I I wanted you to start by saying um we're no longer doing the fortune cookie versus opening message uh comparisons. But this <laughs> one in particular was great. The opening text was a child stolen is a hope lost. Which, wouldn't the parents of every child who gets stolen away to become a Jedi probably think something like that? Shh, don't worry about it. <laughs> we don't talk about that. <laughs> well, do I mean, when kids get stolen to become Jedi, I feel like their, their parents are kind of told. Like, they're not just straight up kidnapped, right? Right. No, they're not kidnapped, but it certainly seems like they're not given much of a choice. Yeah. It's more of a like... Who would choose otherwise? They get to join mm-hmm. the illustrious Jedi Order. Mm, yeah. It is everyone's dream. Yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. And have no attachments whatsoever, no hope of grandkids, no hope of, you know, so someone paying for your retirement home. propaganda. Well, it's like, I mean, the sort of myopic Jedi, right? Like, they are right. Everyone loves the Jedi. Why would anyone not love the Jedi? Therefore... Mm-hmm. Why would anyone leave? Yeah. So yeah, what did you guys think of this episode? Uh, yeah, I mean, I really liked it. I like that we get uh, an introduction to Greedo again. Um, and I like that it, it isn't as Jedi-focused. Um, mm-hmm. like we do have Ahsoka kind of going off and doing her own thing. Um, 
But she's not, like, lightsaber battling her way to victory. She's kind of using her, like, investigative skills. Right. I mean, like, she does use... Like, she uses her Jedi mind trick seemingly for the first time on her own. Yeah, she's it's interesting because... It. She's it, bad at it's, it. She's not very good at it, but it was interesting to me because it's not a power we see the Jedi use very often, which... I mean, frankly, because it would just erase so many of the plots, but I, being reminded of it, I was kind of like, why Why don't they use this more often? This would change so many problems. I mean, I, I kind of liked that it appeared to be a struggle for her. And in the mm. um, the next episode, we see she, she attempts to use it and fails. So, like, this idea of, like, oh, well, they're not using the mind truck all the time because it's really hard. And it doesn't right. always work. Even though, in the past, every time we've seen it be used, it's like a simple hand wave and easily works. Um, yeah. I thought that added to it. And then there's also a moment where she uses her Jedi powers to hover Senator Chuchi in a room <laughs> briefly, which is a uh-huh. little uh, interesting. So, <laughs> but but other than that, it, it's less, yeah, Jedi lightsaber swinging and a little more intrigue investigation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think that's true. Um yeah, and so basically, like, in this episode, we have a couple of, like, twists and turns and eventually figuring out who it was. Um, it didn't feel like it, it was a, a hugely significant episode. I just felt like there were a lot of great little character moments that I loved. Um, towards the beginning, Anakin is explaining uh, why he feels like that he can put... For, first, he doesn't want to have anyone in charge of this. As he says, um, this is a job for the local police. To which I wrote, who the hell decides that? Because it seems like in the past there's a lot of local police matters that they are very happy to jump into. Um, but I really I really liked there's a moment when he's explaining all the, his sort of ideas about what a Padawan should do. And Padme, as she's walking away, just says, I can't believe they let you teach. Um, <laughs> which just felt like, yeah, that's a good question, Padme. I wonder why does Anakin get to teach young Jedi? Neither can I, Padme. Neither can I. Yeah. Uh, it's, I mean, I like that they're drawing attention to it as well, right? In that, like, Anakin is not a good teacher, but we're not trying to pretend that he is. Mm hmm. Which is nice. Yeah. But he's, like, the chosen one, so he just gets to get away with a lot of stuff that most Jedi wouldn't. Yeah, no, I mean, I, it's interesting I, that all good. the Jedi get away with nonsense. Sure. They just go around and. and... Sometimes they say they respect local laws, but other times they're just like, we're the Jedi. YOLO. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, like, internally, within the Jedi themselves, Anakin seems to get away with, with more. But yeah, externally, the Jedi just do whatever they want. It's like, I think we talked about it before, but in Star Trek, how the, oh gosh, the rule of, co- no, what's the it called? Prime Directive. Prime Directive. I was like, the first rule? The Prime Directive <laughs> uh, just seems to apply whenever it's convenient for the plot yeah. or whenever it's convenient for uh, the characters. Now, but yeah. I think that's true. And we, we've talked before about how in space battles, there'll be times when someone gives Anakin an order and he just ignores it. And so Obi-Wan just sort of shrugs to one of the other generals and goes, well, that's Anakin for you um, in what should be in the military, you know, breaking the chain of command and like actually a court martial offense. Um so yeah, it, it, it's it's nice seeing that kind of played out in some other settings. Um, I also just liked, I like getting to see a little bit more of the internal workings of the Trade Federation. <laughs> um, since one of the things that we have here is the Trade Federation. Um, once again, we're, we're playing on this story of Newt Gunray as this extremist who the rest of the Trade Federation is trying very hard to separate themselves from. Um, it's there's a moment. <laughs> there's a moment towards the, epi- towards the end of the episode where they're given proof and the the senator from the trade federation is saying oh i i I can't believe this we're so shocked yeah um and what i wrote is we are shocked shocked to discover uh separatists among the trade federation in a (laughs) casablanca reference here um but yeah i I kind of enjoy that no one should believe lot dot i i can't fathom how he keeps getting away with this well he's got such a cool hat the Pope hat. He does have a cool hat. But yeah, yeah, just his whole like, oh, and, and in that same speech, Matthew, so yeah, this is after it's been discovered that there are separatists and they were the ones who kidnapped uh, Pap- Papanoida, Papanoida, I can't even, I'm not, mm-hmm. uh, his kids, his daughters, <laughs> which is like a no-doy moment, but also like they did it as leverage to 
convince him to join the separatists, which seems like a bad idea. Like, join us. We've kidnapped your kids. Um, but anyway. Yeah, someone should someone should really give Count Dooku how to make friends and influence people. Because yeah, right. he's not very good at it. He isn't. So, uh, so here's what's actually going on. This this confused me. Okay. So I went and tried to figure it out. <laughs> the Trade Federation, the mm-hmm. legitimate part of the Trade Federation, you know, led by Lot Dodd, yep. um, is blockading Pantora. Yeah. Because Pantora has defaulted on a loan or something like that, some financial thing. So they're like, we're going to blockade you and no ships are getting in with supplies because you need to pay us money. Right. And this is legal maybe in the republic um you know listen already banks have pretty aggressive (laughs) eviction uh, policies and i could see it yeah but then um unbeknownst to the pantorans you know lot dot is working with the separatists and dooku is offering to resolve this problem if they join the separatists, yes. it's like, oh, the trade the trade federation is yes. So to Pantora, the trade federation is still part of the legitimate republic, and they're doing this offensive action. And the separatists are like, well, if you join us, we'll protect you from the trade federation. Sure. Wink, wink. And then also, we're gonna kidnap your kids. P.S. So yes, they kidnap their kids, but again, that's not known to be Dooku. By everyone. Then how does it work as leverage? Like, I don't... This plan makes no sense. Again, Dooku is offering to help them recover their kids. Oh, okay. Because he... I mean, he has them. Oh, your kids happen to have been kidnapped. Yeah. I can help you do that? Okay, all right. Still, it's... Yeah, so one one of the daughters is on the ship of the Trade Federation, which uh, uh, Ahsoka and Senator Chuchi go to check out and find, find her there. But then at the end... Well, then they con- confront some of the Trade Federation. It turns out, like, the main dude on the ship didn't know, but, like, a couple other guys on the ship obviously knew. So, yeah, he's right. giving the speech. He's like, oh, that new gun ray. What a guy, huh? Uh, <laughs> and part of the speech, he's like, and yeah, I mean, I guess these kids were kidnapped by us. Whoops. So, since we're so nice, we've given them back, which is just yeah. like, <laughs> I would hope so. Like... I just, the fact that they, they, they brought out, like, ugh, just because we're, like, the nicest guys ever, we decided to give back these kidnapped children. And, like, mm-hmm. we say children. They're, like, late teens at the, at the yeah. earliest, but still. I mean, kidnapped, though, still. I think a father father's going to be pretty concerned whatever the age of the kids are when they get kidnapped. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it was, it was handled very clumsily and very heavy-handed, but it was nice to see that even within this group of the Trade Federation— that there does seem to be some differences and some, you know, that there was even one of them, one of them who was part of the separatists kind of balked at the idea of kidnapping children. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and as you said, the other captain, like didn't even know this was happening. and was pretty upset about it. And I, I, I liked seeing that the trade federation at least is not a monolithic block, that it does seem to be, they're all lying and covering up for Newt Gunray clearly, but that there, there's a wide range of opinion within that group. Yeah. Yeah. And it l- lends believability to this idea that, New Gunray is just some guy with wacky ideas, and that I like... think I think the rank and file doesn't know mm-hmm. about the conspiracy. Yeah, like I mean, why would you tell them? Yeah, right? but yeah. So the the there's like the captain or the admiral or whatever on the ship. He doesn't know. He just thinks this is a legitimate financial blockade, as, as mm-hmm. they often do. And it's the other it's the other guy who is secretly collaborating with New Gunray and has kidnapped the kids right. and mm-hmm. all that. Right. No, I, th- I think that's super true. Oh, um, I just thought I have another beef about Ahsoka's powers. <laughs> no, please. So I was thinking about when so they they find the senator's daughter, and then like six battle droids and like the big battle droids, not the little skinny Roger Roger guys, descend on Ahsoka, and she just like whips out her lightsaber and destroys them in an instant, and then like. Mm-hmm. Four dudes from the Trade Federation walk up, and she's like, "Oh no, now I am powerless. I can't, I can't face these four people." And it's just a little bit. I don't know. That moment got me. I was like, "You just annihilated these battle droids. I think you could take these guys." Yeah, it, it, it it's. Have you all watched the Umbrella Academy? Yeah. Um, 
we just finished up a series of podcasts, that one on the PandaVision podcast, which I strongly encourage people to check out. And and one of the concerns that we talked about was that you have a couple of you have one character in particular in that show who has very strong powers, but also powers that are completely undefined. Mm. And what it means is that when she's able to overcome the people who are trying to do bad things to her and when they're able to overcome her seems entirely dependent on the plot. Yeah. Um, and I feel like the, especially with Ahsoka, but in general with the Jedi, that's kind of been happening here. You know, there are times where they're like, oh, there's six battle droids. We have to surrender now. And then there are times where it's, there's 600. Oh, no, we can take them in a fight. This is fine. Yeah. Um, I think it's also a morality issue. They have no problem destroying battle droids. But mm -hmm. when it comes to actual people, they sure. have to be a little more careful. I'm not saying Ahsoka should chop in half all these members of the Trade Federation. I'm just saying like she has no real cause to be as intimidated by them as she, she right. acts. And like, I, I agree that it's been highly fluctuating. It's just weird to see it back to back like that. Yeah. It would have been, I had a similar moment of wondering if it said she doesn't want to fight real people, mm. but it would have been nice if she said that, if someone was like, come on, but they, like, no, I can't kill them, yeah. you know? Yeah. Especially since they're not, um, an issue that I've actually been very interested in lately and talking about a lot on, on a couple of different uh, podcasts is this question of when our hero is fighting against someone evil and the evil person has people working for them who aren't necessarily evil, they're just security guards, you know, or people making a buck or whatever it is. And the question of, like, is is the violence against those folks okay? And since these are just, like, Pantoran security guards, they're not, you know, super fascist evil soldiers or something, I can understand her having some hesitation about getting violent with them. Yeah, well, they're, they're not Pantoran security guards. They're um, from the Trade Federation. I forget what their species. Oh, Nemoidian. okay. Nemoidian. Nemoidian, okay. Um, but yeah. They're I mean, more, like, I they're more evil, saying. but that's true. Yeah, especially since we were just talking about, like, we don't think the rank and file knows about the corruption in the Trade Federation. So yeah, I mean, I get that. Yeah, I think Ahsoka's hesitance here is kind of plot-driven in that those guards were working for the legitimate captain. So mm -hmm. they were not quote-unquote evil but yep. she shouldn't i don't know that she should ha know that distinction at this point that's true that's definitely true yeah. the other thing i kind of liked about this episode is that jabba has a kind of honor among thieves attitude um <laughs> which is interesting like the 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 uh prime minister is able to appeal to jabba as a fellow parent which um, I think one of you wrote that that's the only reason why Jabba has a kid, so we can have that moment. <laughs> yeah, I, I was like, oh, Jabba has a kid, and then like they mention it. Oh, like as a parent, Jabba, you understand. It's like, oh, so the only reason we had this little like Jabba feeding the kid was this. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I I forgot. Like I. Well, yeah, I, when when the scene happens and there's like a little a little baby hut. And he's playing with his food, and Jabba chastises him about playing with his food. We were like, is that Jabba's kid? Does Jabba have a kid? I guess so. Yeah, and then uh, the senator comes along, trying to figure out what's happened to his daughters. He's like, well, Jabba, as a parent yourself. I'm like, ah, oh, this is why. But they also seem to have had, like, previous interactions. Like, he seems to know and be friendly with Jabba. Because there's, mm -hmm. um, he's saying, like, well, I, I, I know that you would never do this to me, Jabba, because we're bros. Uh, and if Greedo did this, then, I mean, he must have been working outside of your purview because, yeah, I know right. you wouldn't do this. Let's compare Greedo's blood to the blood I found at this crime scene that the uh, inspector, the civilian inspector was like, nope, no sign of a struggle. Mm hmm. Yeah. It was nice to see our favorite civilian ins instructor come back from a couple of seasons ago. Yeah. Uh, he didn't really get to do much in this episode, but it was nice to see see him uh, popping around again. Just Yeah, just as incompetent as ever. It was great. <laughs> um, anything else in this episode, or are we ready to move on? There was there was something I was thinking of, and I completely forget it now, but I'm sure I'll blur okay. it out later on. Nice. Um, so the next two episodes are definitely an arc, but they're... Two distinct stories, even though they're very similar themes. Let's talk about them one by one. Um, but I'm sure we'll bleed in between the two. The first one is Corruption, episode 49, season 3, episode 5. Padme, on a diplomatic mission to Mandalore, guarantees the pacifist planet 
which is a very interesting phrase. I think they mean the neutral planet because it's supposed to have a warrior culture. But anyway, um, guarantees the planet the Republic's full protection. But she and Duchess Satine soon find something sinister lurking beneath the planet's serene facade. Mugen smugglers have been sneaking in supplies, including bottled tea destined for the Mandalorian schools. To increase their profits, they've been diluting the tea with a hazardous chemical. Um, just yes. dilute it with water. Yeah. What the heck? <laughs> they even mentioned, like, well, the kids just have fresh drinking water, and that can't be poisoned. So, like... Yeah. Yeah. It's so We're going to dilute this with lead. Nothing could go wrong. I, I feel like this is when... The people doing Clone Wars really wanted to lean into the idea of, like, their show as social commentary, especially commentary for for things that are relevant to kids, but that they're being so heavy-handed about it. Mm. Um, you know, and, and so much of this is kind of... Because a lot of it's about, uh, you know, what war does to a planet and how there's, like, poverty and uh, corruption is spreading and everything's going bad because of war profiteering, you know, all of which were things people were concerned about uh, here in the United States. But especially, I was remembering... This episode came out around the time that there was all this discussion about kids having sugary drinks in schools. Mm. Um, and I kind of wonder, like, is, is the fact that they chose, like, a drink that they kind of... I think they get it not out of an actual vending machine, but something that looks kind of similar. Like, it seemed like we were definitely sort of a... Let's have a little jab about, like, the thing kids are, uh, kids are drinking from outside vendors in schools. Yeah, and they're definitely, like, they're in what looks to be like a plastic bottle and it's got that like bright neon label and yeah it looks very much like like a bottle of sprite or something Mm -hmm. and they even mention like oh this isn't provided by the school this is like an outside vendor bringing in these sugary drinks the school only provides them fresh drinking water yeah exactly and that and that's the whole thing is all those sugary drinks were always like through outside vendors and vending machines and stuff Mm -hmm. like that um but in terms of the episode itself, what what did you all think of uh, what we got here? Well, so you you mentioned pacifist. Mandalore is currently a pacifist under Duchess Satine. Mm, so okay. after their civil war, she created like this new Mandalore government, and and basically declared pacifism, like going against the old ways. Right. Yeah. Which Death Watch, etc., is not right. thrilled about. Yeah. Yeah, I like. So, I mean, clearly Satine and Padme have a friendly relationship. Like, they're friends. Yeah, that was a weird sentence. Anyway, uh, (laughs) they're friends. And so when Padme's being welcomed, Satine's like, hey, why don't you come in and sit in on this government talk that's happening Mm -hmm. about whether we should or shouldn't be dealing with the black market? Yeah. And I... and. Padme is like, well, maybe I should talk to them. <laughs> and I like that she stands up, says a few things, and then the rest of the, the government instantly shuts her down. You know, like, mm-hmm. who who said you could say anything, corrupt Republic official? Um, it was great. It was nice to see somebody sort of put in their place instead of just this idea of, like, our main characters are these, like, arbiters of good and truth. Yeah. I mean, we keep talking about the the hubris that's involved of the Republic and the Jedi, both thinking, like, as you said, they're the arbiters of goodness and truth. And and I really like Mandalore is the one to kind of call that out. Mm -hmm. You know, Satine is very clear that she thinks that the Senate and the Republic are just, you know, completely corrupt and power hungry and war profiteering. All of which we pretty much know is true by this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, She's not wrong. (laughs) mm -hmm. Yeah. I also like their wigs. I think that's great. Yep, they they have some good wings. They, there's a couple of great scenes with Padme and um um Sat- Sabine. Is it Satine or Sabine? Satine, Satine. yeah, Sabine's rebels. Sa- right. Um, but the two of them having kind of a you know a uh, uh, hair off uh, is pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, the is it? There's that one headpiece that um sh- the um there's that one headpiece that Satine wears sometimes. Is it like seashells that's in her hair? It looks kind oh, of like. Yeah. Like yeah. long, thin sea urchins or something, or clams? It looks Not like... clams, but like... It's epic. Yeah, it looks like shells. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, Matthew. I, mm-hmm. I, at first I thought it was shells, but watching it, I'm like, is that just her hair? Or it's okay. It's probably not her hair. Like, none of these headpieces, I doubt, are, are actually these women's hair. They're probably like very right. similar to like the wigs that the aristocracy wore in like France, etc. But 
Yeah, I think it might be hair in those like neat swirls that kind of like make the halo around her head. It's cool. It's mm-hmm. probably my yeah. favorite headpiece. Speaking yeah. of ridiculous headgear, mm-hmm. Satine's oh. <laughs> like personal private royal guard or whatever have these helmets that are just absurd. Like I understand like ceremonially, like if they're just standing guard at the palace, like you want to mm-hmm. have fancy helmets. But on, on part of this episode, like they go on this mission to the docks to, to find the corruption. <laughs> and so the guard bad. is still wearing this ridiculous helmet that's so wide <laughs> that it just blocks the view of people behind. And they're like trying to look around his helmet. Yeah. So... L- listen, in a world where people do run around using swords, laser swords, granted, but still swords, you never know when someone's going to bring back jousting. And you need to have your jousting helmet ready, complete with that visor that folds down to, you know block out most sight in order to be ready for the like job extra it has flare wings on the side like was that is that yeah. a medieval thing it's yeah. like wide it's a super super thin yeah, it's wide it's like helmet. shoulder wide and it's got like big old ears but they're not ears it's just helmet <laughs> it's very very inspired silly. by an elephant yeah <laughs> it's very, very elephant. dumbo yeah. helmet but yeah I mean, there's one so in in all sorts of tv franchises but i feel like sci-fi is, is maybe especially guilty of it you get, like, the dude in front explaining what's happening in front of characters who are standing right there and should be aware of it. And this mm-hmm. happens at the dock where the guard who's in front is is literally just narrating what is going on in front of them. And I'm like, they yeah. can see that. Oh, wait, maybe they can't because your helmet's in the way. <laughs> there you go. There you go. At it's least, a perfect exposition yeah, tool. Yeah. At least he explains it well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah One of my pet peeves on Star Trek is that the away team... Oh, yeah will like be in contact with the bridge and Captain Picard or whoever will be like, what's going on down there, number one? And they'll just give the most generic trouble. description. Yeah, trouble. <laughs> You're yeah. not going to like this. It's like, no, tell us. Or you better should, yet, you should get come see body this. cams. Yeah. I, I, just, I, I always saw it as kind of like, you know, the parent at the dinner table, you know, okay, Riker, how was high school? How, how was you know, school <laughs> today? And he's like, it was fine. Yeah. Good. The away mission was fine. It was good. I we met a girl. Stuff. It was fine. Yeah. I stood over some chairs. But yeah, but if they, <laughs> if they didn't have the script, it's like none of yeah. the descriptions of what's going on on the planet make sense. Yeah, but the guard okay. actually does say exactly what is happening. Yeah. Which is yeah. Like, yeah. That guy uh, appears I, to be taking bribes. I, I, I did quite like this episode, though. I, I really enjoyed getting to see... Again, more of kind of the what's happening to normal people who are not in the Republic or Separatist War, but just sort of how the war is affecting people. I find those stories really interesting. And I I like that the antagonists wind up, it's not Death Watch, it's not the Separatists, it's not even someone who is, you know, they're not trying to like cause a political scandal. They're just trying to make a buck. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just think it makes for an interesting kind of story to see this feels like more like a day in the life of how people are being affected by these things instead of it having to be part of the, the great Uber narrative. Yeah. And I, I mean, I really like, I like Satine a lot as a character and I like her and Padme's interaction. And I think it's just really nice to see like two strong female characters taking up a majority of the screen time and not just being like damsels in distress. Like they don't do mm-hmm. everything perfectly, but I mean, Satine really seems to be narrating the action of this episode or like um not narrating causing forcing force. driving she's driving, driving. She, she's... there you go driving there yeah, she's a she's a protagonist yeah but yeah i i don't <laughs> the idea of using literal poison to dilute your soft drinks <gasps> because all right am i the only one who's gonna find positives here <laughs> no, 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 we can no, go, no we can go back to the negative <laughs> we just talked about a bunch of pe- positives, Matthew. We can keep talking about positives. Okay. No, no go ahead about the, the the poison. Oh, well, I was just going to say, like, that's sort of my... I don't know. It's... it's. Oh, okay. I remember what I wanted to say about the last episode, and it ties into this episode. Here we oh, go. Oh, go for it. So, last episode, the Pantorans have, like, vaguely New Zealand-Australian South African accents, but it's not internally consistent. And I was mentioning this to Riki when we were watching it. I'm like, it kind of bugs me. Like, I, I'm i already suspending disbelief in that they're all speaking English. Like, they don't need to force these accents. I can, I'm fine without it. And it, especially when it's not related to character. 
like in the last episode there's a bounty hunter who's like a goat man and he talks mm-hmm. with like a little like goat kind of bleeding Brr. voice yeah and right. that makes sense right like that affects the character um and in this episode the people who are selling the poison to dilute the soft drinks are uh like snake people but they don't have any sort of accent. But, like, if they would have had, like, a hissing sort of way of speech, I'd have been fine with that. I'm also fine with them not having an accent at all. And I think that's great. Yeah. But, yeah. Sorry. Those guys who, like, they just show up. They're like, yeah, we knew there's going to be a big parade today, which is why we came to the dock when there's not a lot of folks. Here's your inspection fee, corrupt government official. And he says, thank you, and wanders away. And then they go to the, is it the su- superintendent of the schools? They're like, we're going to sell you the stuff to dilute your soft drink with. Yeah, I think it's whoever's the bottler for the, the soft drink. Okay. And, then, mm-hmm. and they then turn around and sell it to the schools. There's, yeah. there's one point where they follow the trail of evidence to a guy. And he just, like, openly admits to <laughs> yeah. criminal activity. And he kind of like, yeah, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, uh-huh. he was great. Yeah, they're just like, you're the one who's distributing this. And he's like, yeah. And they're like, you're taking bribes. And he's like. Yeah, I am. Yeah. So so what, Duchess? <laughs> and it, I mean, I think it's it's funny, but it's also like a a point of I mean, earlier on in the in the meeting that Padme was at when they're talking about like, well, are we accepting these goods that are coming from the black market? We kind of don't have a choice because otherwise, how would we get food? The fact that there is this black market broker who's just like so open about like, yeah, I'm accepting bribes. Yes, I'm right. trafficking yeah. these stolen goods. What are you going to do about it? Makes right. makes sense. And I thought it was a really nice touch. Feels maybe like a little prohibition era. Yeah. Yeah. Where technically, this is all illegal, but come on, like, give me my whiskey. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it even, and I, I like that it goes as high even as the governing council, that there's someone in the governing council who at one point says, like, look, we know the black market's happening. We could shut it down, but it's how our people are eating, mm-hmm. you know, that, that we can't. Uh, bring in regular shipments of food and stuff like that because of how bad the war is and what our money situation is. And I, I, I think it's a really interesting situation for a government like that to be in because you, uh, you bring up prohibition. I think that's true. It also makes me think of um, England during World War II, where you had very strict uh, rationing, and then people were trying to get around it in different ways. And to some extent, it was it was needed to do that, mm-hmm. um, you know. But obviously, brings up all these questions of if it's happening in the black market now, there's no government regulation. You get to put poison in the water and, and the yeah. tea, um, tea for some reason. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I think one of you had a, one last comment on the uh, Satine's request for a Jedi. Yeah, and it leads into the, the next episode. So at the end of the episode, Satine and Padme are parting ways, and Satine says, you know, she's going to keep investigating this corruption. And like, hey, Padme, you should probably send one of your Jedi friends to, like, help investigate this corruption. I don't know, like, maybe one with a beard. I don't know. Maybe just like send one of your Jedi friends. Obi Wan, send me Obi Wan. Uh, and and Padme's like, should yeah, have been more specific. Sure thing. I'm definitely going to send you one of my Jedi friends. And uh, and the next episode opens with Ahsoka hopping off of a, a cruiser as the Jedi that Padme has sent. Uh. <laughs> it's just like you sent me a literal child. I wanted my boyfriend, and yeah. you sent a literal child. <laughs> And the literal child, uh, you know, has some interesting moments, as we'll get to in the next episode. So, uh, anything else on this one, or should we move on to The Academy? The Academy. Right. Yeah, Ep- good. Episode 50, uh, which is the sixth episode of season three, The Academy. Uh, oh, by the way, we have not been mentioning the um, writers and directors. Um, this one is, uh, the first one was directed by Kyle Dunleavy and written by Katie Lucas and Stephen Melching. Uh, the second one was directed by Juan Carlo Volpe and directed, uh, written by Cameron uh, Livshock. And this third one is dr- directed again by Juan Carlo Volpe and written by the folks who wrote the first one, Katie Lucas and Stephen Melching. Um, and so the plot is, Ahsoka is assigned as a teacher at the, at the Cadet Academy on Mandalore while covertly investigating the corruption inside Satine's administration. Soon after she arrives, Satine's zealous nephew, Corky and his classmates uncover a nefarious plot. Um, so yeah, what, what's our take on uh, the academy and what we learn here? Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's odd that Ahsoka is being brought on 
as a teacher at the academy and like clearly it is just a front like her her purpose there is to investigate this corruption uh-huh. but yeah it's a it's a little weird but then i mean she befriends the cadets and basically tells them like oh, it's your job to root out corruption wherever it is bye yeah and i like that she's assigned specifically with this idea of um basically training the new generation i thought there was something kind of wonderfully cynical about this idea of well the ruling class is already so corrupt and and politicized we can't do anything about them all we can do is hope for the next generation of leaders Mm -hmm. yeah and i think it's interesting that corky who's so satina's a duchess they seem to be in some sort of um like monarchical uh why can't i talk today what's a democracy monarchical democracy uh where satine is yeah the duchess um but then Mm -hmm. there's also a prime minister and other seats in cabinet uh and corky yeah is the duchess's nephew so theoretically part of this royal family but also just chilling at the the academy with a bunch of other kids his age yeah which is neat but i mean they it doesn't take much for them to head out an adventure right like it, it's an it's a simple suggestion from ahsoka and then the next night they're down at the docks spying taking covert videos trying to uncover kids these. kids adventuring is one of my least favorite plots mm. mm-hmm. because it, it to me i don't know like kids shouldn't be that good at, at anything <laughs> anything i mean I, kids can be good at stuff but i don't know Maybe and I in just fact, a, they're bad, they're, right? Oh, they're terrible they're at this. They're very bad yeah. at sneaking around. Um, they're talking too loud. I don't know how they were discovered. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, they, they, they go and break into the warehouse and very loudly talking. They're like, I hear voices. Right. Someone else is in here. And then, yeah, sneak up, start arguing about whether they should or should not be there. I, yeah. And then end up knocking something over and alerting mm-hmm. people who chase yeah. them and chase them away. And then they... Uh, they end up going to Corky's aunt, Satine, and they're like, look, this is obviously evidence of corruption. And I think she rightly points out, like, maybe they chased you away because you were sneaking around an off-limits government facility. <laughs> and, like, there was corruption. The kids were right. But still, I'm like, yeah, yeah that's an excellent point. Yeah, th- there's a little bit of an element of a conspiracy theory among the kids of, you know, it, it um, online right now in our own world, uh, there's these discussions happening about, um, you know, once again, we're back to fears of this epic child sex trafficking ring oh, that's gosh. working out of the White House and the NBA and ten million other places. And anyone who in any way is maybe trying to not have this happen for their own reasons, of course, you must be part of the conspiracy. Um, and it definitely seems like that's kind of what the kids are thinking here, which, you know, if you're 16 and you've also we, – we talked about how this is kind of a world of nobility, like uh, – Ahsoka is not trying to educate every 16-year-old on the planet. Clearly, the idea is, like, these kids are the, the children of the ruling elite. They'll probably be the ruling elite themselves, which I think is a, an interesting point about the, the world. Um, but, yeah, it makes sense that those kids, you know, if someone gets in their way, of course it's a big conspiracy. What else would it be? Yeah. Yeah. There's, like, delusions of grandeur, right? I mean, they, they're they right, which is... Makes it worse. Yeah, it makes it worse. It's a conspiracy that goes all the way to the top. But, yeah. The Prime is. Minister Almec... Who is is the head honcho? Yeah, and Prime Minister Almec is the person Corky goes to second because he's like, well, I mean, he practically raised me. I've known him since he was a baby. Of course, we can trust him. Uh, and it's just like it's weird that they have these like deep seated conspiracy theory, but don't extrapolate to maybe the folks I know and love who are very powerful in the government are in on it. Right. I mean, that's a hard leap to make, mm-hmm. you know, I, and I, I think I think the show does a nice job of illustrating again how this kind of culture makes that kind of thinking hard. When I wrote down um, uh, one of the kids at one point says when they think when the, the idea of the prime minister himself being corrupt and, and the literal line is he's the leader of our, he's the leader of our system. He couldn't possibly be a traitor. Um, and I think that's it, it's frustrating, but I think that's very believable, especially from someone in that kind of a position, you know, like. Yeah. We just can't imagine that, that that could be the case. But especially, I don't know, like when they tell, so they, they like phone up Almec um, and tell him, you know, we took this secret video of this clandestine meeting 
um, we're pretty sure there's corruption. He's like, mm, mm, cool. You should bring that video and everybody who knows about this to this one specific plot place. Don't tell anybody else, but make sure everybody who knows about it and the video <laughs> are there. Thank right. you. And he's like, that's, that should set, should have set off some alarm bells, right? I, I suppose. Oh, and then Ahsoka's magical enhanced technology to... <laughs> oh, that's Blade Runner esque. Yeah, there's so the kids have taken a recording of this clandestine meeting, and there's a, obviously a figure in a hood because we all know in in Clone Wars a hood hides your identity completely. Um, and Ahsoka looks at the hologram, pauses it, and then is basically just like enhance, and it shows that it's Senator Almac's face, and it's just like how like I could see if it was like shadowy or fuzzy. Because, like, in real in pictures, if you, like, up contrast and stuff like that, sometimes you can see some stuff that's in shadows. But, come on. Come on. Is that how holographs work? I don't think so. I, I guess. <laughs> is there anything <laughs> you, is there anything you guys did? Is there anything? I, I, we're focusing on everything that's wrong with it again. I'm just, um, I, I'm a little concerned we're just getting very, very negative again. Is there stuff you guys did like about this episode? or, or If these just weren't episodes you liked, that's fine. But I want to just kind of get a sense of, I, I don't want us to get too locked into, like, this little detail didn't make sense. This little detail didn't make sense. Um, little details that don't make sense are the funnest parts to talk about. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I mean, I did. I liked the episode overall. Um, I, especially, I like Corky, and we see Corky later on. And it was, like, a fun episode. There is action involved. And it, it right. had this, like, uh, political machinations without it divulging into just being, like, I don't know. I mean, I know you guys like it. But for me, it's just, like, boring political procedure. No, right? that's legit. Like, there was talk about politics and stuff like that. But it wasn't, like, ah, yes, and in Bill 23C of the Senate code blah 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 blah, blah. <laughs> that yeah, was, I, that I, was I, the other one la dog mentions like treaty 16 74 yeah something. but it's not like a major plot point it's just like him talking yeah. and that's fine too like I, right. I that's the kind of right like i don't i don't need the politics of the world to make sense so like last episode when they were talking about politics it was just kind of like hand wavy like mm, regulations and that was fine and i like that like you don't you don't need to explain to me the intricate political systems of right. this galaxy because they probably don't make sense, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> we can probably just read the role playing book about life on Mandalore to sure. get like, all those actual details. <laughs> yeah, and I like we get more Satine going and investigating, and that's cool. And she's like in take no guff mode, which I really, yeah. I really like. What about you, Ricky? What, what was kind of your overall take on the episode? I just don't like these kids. I don't, I don't like <laughs> kids. When you have kids like uncover the plot and defeat the villain, I think it just cheapens the villain. Mm-hmm. Well, but I mean, these aren't kids. These aren't kids like Boba Fett's age. Aren't they supposed to be like seventeen, eighteen? Yeah, but they seem they seem so innocent and clueless. Like Ahsoka is teaching them stuff that I feel like they should have. That's known. fair. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. They, they seem like sheltered rich kids who mm-hmm. again like should not be this good at uncovering the secret conspiracy. So because... I like Almec a lot, and, and we're gonna get more Almec later in the series. Yeah, and I definitely. think he's an intriguing character in in this whole Mandalore political landscape. And so again, like to have him foiled by the the Academy kids is kind of. Well, disappointing he's not that's really fair. foiled by them like he's kind of foiled by them right like they catch on but he knows that they've caught on almost instantly and kind of lays a counter trap to their trap right yeah it, but again like you you mentioned like how obvious that trap was sure and i, I thought maybe he's underestimating because they're kids but it's it could have been better i think okay. it, it would have been more surprising right mm-hmm. if he mm-hmm. hadn't laid that obvious trap and they go to him, and then he betrays them, and you're like, "Oh shoot, it's Almec." Yeah, I guess what I what I liked about it was that it's not just the because I I agree that the kids as the method of exploring all this corruption wasn't my favorite necessarily, but I guess it didn't bother me too much. Um, but I did like that not only does he trap the kids, but he also traps Ahsoka, who granted is also a kid; she's maybe even younger than them. But he and he kind of traps her with her own hubris because it's her assumption that her mind control is working. Yes. yes. Uh, that was actually satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. 
that that felt like her, especially because we did see her use it successfully earlier and so i like getting her be like oh okay so this is easy now N- nope <laughs> yeah yeah the fact that she's I, I, yeah i agree i totally agree i really like that moment because it was so difficult for her to do last episode or two episodes right. ago rather and yeah to for her to just be like oh jedi mind trick worked again nice gonna use this all the time and then uh all to be like all right guards you can start pretending yeah. the mind trick worked <laughs> arrest ahsoka and she's like oh well and i kind of like that because um we, we've gotten a little of this already this idea that one of the sort of elements of Mandalore culture is that they have been fighting the Jedi for generations. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that if anybody has kind of like, you know, you're sort of trained, okay, the Jedi, your enemy, one of the things they're going to do is mind control. So first of all, it's important to learn how to resist mind control, but also here's how to like, you know, the Jedi are idiots. They're going to always think they did mind control. So if you play along, you can trick them. You know, I love that. That's just kind of like part of the combat, you know, or the, the mental training or whatever it is. Uh, I think one of you also had a comment about um, groups of vagrants in the same cell. Yeah, this is me again, being negative. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, they, they arrest the kids because they, they, they've caught their plot, and they just put them all into the same cell, which seems like a bad idea. And, I mean, I, even something like, ah, let's hold them there temporarily until we can each get them their own cell might have been a nice thing. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's... It makes total sense for the plot because Ahsoka goes in <laughs> and says, like, okay, we're being watched, so be careful how you look. But now I'm going to, like, tell you our whole plan out loud right not now. Listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's just like, this is probably how you got found out, Ahsoka. Um, <laughs> and so, I mean, it makes sense that the kids are all there to talk to at once. But it's just like a, it's a weird, it's a weird thing. And we've seen it happen um, a couple seasons ago when, like, Zero and his gang are all locked in the same cell. It's just like mm-hmm. everybody's doing it. Overcrowded yeah, it's, prison it's prison 101. You either put them in the same cell or right next, to, next each to each other or across from each other. Yeah, there's not much like here's how to prevent nefarious plots from nefariousing. You know, it's, <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, any other uh, last things on this one before we then go on to the. Um, next of the uh or actually uh yeah the next of the mandalore episodes is this no no yeah this was the last one i'm sorry before for the last of our episodes of tonight yeah um yeah so now we have assassin which is uh episode 51 the seventh episode of the third season ri- uh directed by kyle dunlevy and written by katie lucas so a couple of the same people were on all these um excuse me Having volunteered to protect Senator Padme Amidala during a political mission to Alderaan, Padawan Ahsoka Tano is plagued by recurring visions of the presumed dead bounty hunter Ora Singh assassinating the senator. Um, and what we get in this episode is, of course, Ora Singh is still alive, and uh, there's numerous attempts to assassinate her. Uh, she foils all of them, and bringing it back to the huts, it is eventually traced all the way back to Zero the Hut. Um... What, what's our take on uh, this uh, little uh, exploration of assassination and plotting? Well, it's, it's great to have Aura Singh back and not dead. Because <laughs> that, that was kind of like season two was bounty hunters and like, here's Aura Singh. And I'm like, oh, she's dead. But she's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Aura Singh's the... I, I love Aura Singh. Her character's and, great. And I, I don't... Like, so part of me was like... Why is the security at this conference so bad? But I think it's more that Aura Singh is just that good. Yeah. Yeah. And is bypassing all the security. Because she just, like, has her way in, in the in the ducks. Yeah, like, th- this isn't, like, the first episode we talked about tonight, where, um, like, I think Padme says something like, oh, I was worried the senator's kids could get kidnapped, but there's just, like, no <laughs> guards anywhere. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like, forgot that. There are guards all over. Yeah. And, like, they're taking precautions she because... She clowns them. She does, yeah. Like, right, they're taking all sorts of precautions because Ahsoka's had these visions, but Aura Singh is just that good that she can get around all this. Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was fitting. It was a nice way of kind of showing, not telling, uh, just how skilled she is. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially that she's able to kind of get away from the Jedi once or twice. Um, well, you know, I... Also... Go ahead. Sorry. Um, in... Yeah, so uh, Ahsoka has these visions, which I think is neat, and I would love to see, like, explored more. Um, but because of this, they're like, okay, we're gonna 
basically set up a trap. We're going to put a robot in your place, put a hood on it. Hoods disguise everybody. And then you're going to be like in an entirely different room just broadcasting this. So we're definitely going to get Aura when she comes to assassinate the robot. But it's not you surprised. But like Aura Singh obviously cottons onto this and goes to the room where Padme actually is instead of being at all tricked. Where, there, where there's no guard. Yeah, because yeah. they're all guarding the main <laughs> room where quote unquote Padme is supposed to be. So I think that again just shows how good she is at what she does, right? Like, and and we don't have any sort of explanation like, oh no, Aura Singh must have blah 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 to cotton onto our plan. She just does it, and then everyone's fine with it. And I, and I love that, right? Like, I don't need an explanation. Just like you said, show me, don't tell me. Yeah. And also, Zero's great. Yeah. <laughs> he is fun, especially after the um, seeing Jabba the Hutt being kind of intimidating and hut like and now Zero is this... I think really... I, this, what, he, what he makes me think of is in some sort of movie about uh, Mississippi riverboat gamblers, mm-hmm. he's the guy in the white suit with the thick southern accent who's the antagonist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, like, doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Yeah. He's, like, drinking mint juleps. And I love that they... He's such a counterpoint to Aura Singh because they really easily trick him into admitting his guilt. Yes. It's so well done. Yeah. And, and it was nice, too, because I remember having a moment of, like, what Padme is trying hard to do is create this refugee conference, which, which we should talk about in a second. It's hard for me to find, like, who's the political side that really wants her dead right now. And I remember thinking, like, why is someone so out to kill her? And finding out that it's actually just this, you know, two-bit gangster whose plans she foiled a while ago. Yeah, that, that makes a lot more sense. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I didn't remember why Zero had this grudge. And it's because it turns out that, that this was the plot of the original Clone Wars movie. That was kind of, I guess, like the pilot movie. Mm-hmm. And, and we didn't actually watch that. Yeah, but I mean, I don't think it's... I mean, I, I didn't know that, but I was also fine with the explanation of Zero wanted yeah, her yeah, dead yeah. for some reason. Zero yeah. decided it was unfair that he was in prison and that Padme was responsible and yeah. found a way to hire an assassin. The the villain the villain manipulating things from prison is a classic trope. Mm-hmm. Although, again, yeah. like, how? You, you, <laughs> you must have corruption in your prison, then. Because you know, he's in a literal cell alone. Look, they have to have a prison yard, you know, where he gets to, like, you know, squirm around and then move his tail. And yeah. I guess they, kick, you know. Kick the rocks. Sit in the shade <laughs> and, like, fan himself and drink his mint juleps. Um, one thing I noticed in this episode, and I, I it's been a, a thing in a, a number of the Star Wars, both movies and shows. But this is the first time I really noticed it. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on it. Yoda seems to have this, like, ready room, you know, kind of like Picard's <laughs> ready room, where he meets people in the Jedi Temple, clearly. And it's got, you know, comfortable chairs and things like that. But the windows seem to have these permanently installed Venetian blinds is the best way I can describe them. Yeah, it's and what very it means, dark. It, it's very dark, but it also means that the sunlight is coming in, but in these very, like, divided up beams so that everything looks like it's a mix of light and shadow. Um, and it has to take an awful lot to animate that. So it strikes me that it has to be fairly intentional. Um, do you think that is just supposed to look cool or... Because I was trying to think of, like, symbolisms that could have in terms of, like, something about, like, the the parallels of light and darkness or, or something like that. Um, am I reading way too much into it or do you think there might be something there? I personally think you're reading too much into it. I think it's a Battlestar Galactica. We chopped the corners of our paper in the first That's episode. entirely fair, yeah. And, like, in the, in the movie where Yoda has this room, they're like, oh, we'll put these cool blinds because we can just, like, CGI everything. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I mean... I never noticed, but I, I don't know. I don't think you're reading too much into it. Or if you are, like, keep doing it. I think it's interesting. <laughs> head cannon um, everything. Hmm? I said head cannon everything. Head cannon everything. Yeah. Why not? Um, yeah. I, I honestly, like, we j- just watched these last night and I forgot that Yoda was in this. And I think, like, Yoda's role in Clone Wars has been really interesting, especially since, like, Yoda opens the entire series in the very first episode that not, not uh, chronologically the first episode, but the first episode that we see. Right. Um, and even when like Ahsoka comes to him for help, he's just kind of like, Oh yeah. Visions. That's weird. And like, 
I, I don't know. I, 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 it's tough to tell what Yoda's role is. Um, and he hasn't gotten to, like, kooky Yoda yet, where he was, mm-hmm. like, beating droids with a stick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, like, being a mentor, it seems like he's just bogged down in bureaucracy. Oh, yeah. You know, it, if you went from being, like, the head of the, the biggest bureaucratic council on in the universe to now being locked on a swamp for 18 years, you know, hitting a droid with a stick might seem like a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Oh, yeah. No, I'm all about mm-hmm. swamp Yoda. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, Yoda being locked in this, like, bureaucracy, it's not, it's not what he gets to do. And I think like, we talked about this at the very first episode. Him being out with the clones, talking to them about their individuality, and, like, brokering a deal with the Toydarians yeah. is what Yoda's good at. And yeah, I mean, having him in maybe, maybe that's like some sort of significance with the blinds. Like he's yeah, he's being shadowed by his his bureaucratic role. <laughs> so he occurred to me. Naps. Did, <laughs> did we see a clone in any of these four episodes? Oh my goodness! <laughs> yes, um, when Anakin is like dropping off or picking up Ahsoka from Mandalore. <laughs> a clone. Yeah, I think I think Rex is with Anakin, and he says something like, "We, we got to get going, Commander." Okay. Or general. Then there's yeah, like I mean, D. Bradley Baker voices uh, a character in one of these, but okay. I don't remember which one. So that's a helpful comment. But yeah, I mean, we get very, very little of the the clones. We have almost none of the like. I don't think there's a single like separatist, you know, um, Republic battle in any of these four episodes. Um, it's definitely an interesting direction I think that this season is going of taking us away from just showing battlefield after battlefield. And showing much more what's happening on some of the other planets, like you know the home front kind of situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, like, and I I like it. I don't know, like, yeah. I do I do really like the storylines that dig into um, the clones. Uh, like we talked about last episode, those two that um, the two bookend episodes uh, that that dealt with them in training, and then when they were arc troopers was really interesting but i i like seeing what else is going on in the galaxy and i think it's a, pr- a point you brought up a lot matthew where there's more than just the republicans and the separatists shooting lasers yeah. at each other right and it's nice to see the implications of, of their battles and, and what's going on and even then like i know that there was a lot of political talk especially in like padme's speeches but i i really liked how they did it with padme was giving a speech that was kind of almost background noise. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. her speech wasn't really that important. It was important because you got the idea that she was an impassioned speaker. And that's all that really mattered. And then there were just, like, some words coming out of her mouth. Which is yeah. totally fine, <laughs> right? Like, I would much rather have this, like, general tone of, like, okay, Padme's a very, very good orator going on in the background. And then having our action overlay it. Instead of just, like parking ourselves and listening to yeah. Padme talk. Yeah, I think it was a nice balance because you're right. It, it, they name the fact that there's this refugee crisis going on and they name the fact that like there's there's senators who are interested in dealing with the, the casualties of the war, not just the war. But then, yeah, it doesn't actually get into any of the details, which was kind of nice because when we, the, the parts of her speech that we do here just seem like completely empty platitudes about like, fighting for truth and for mm-hmm. rightness and like they make no sense whatsoever yeah but i'm like we i'm must totally move okay forward with that. not backwards yeah. <laughs> always <laughs> twirling twirling towards victory yeah what's that, what that from that's from the simpsons that oh nice okay because of horror special i think kang and kodos are running for president um nice anyway yeah i i don't know the the parts of like the politics of the star wars universe that i don't like are when the things that are coming out of the senator's mouths are like really, really important and matter a lot. Because a lot of it, I find, is just kind of boring, right? Like, <laughs> give me the summary. Okay, there are refugees, and we're trying to help them. And some people don't think we should. Cool, go. Like, I don't know. I'm fine with it. Maybe I'm. I'm just not as politically savvy. But... <laughs> no, no. I'm. I'm saying, yeah, I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying, like, given that when they try to go too far into the politics, it doesn't work very often. I I thought this was a nice way of doing it, of like naming the politics were happening, but let it be in the background while, while we do the important stuff. Yeah. And I feel like you don't really need to pay attention to what Padme is saying, especially because like other stuff is going on and there are some characters like talking over her. She's just kind of talking in the background, but you get the tone of her voice and like 
the way that she's speaking. And that's good. That's all we really need. Yeah, it's definitely true. Yeah, and I think if they do it um, sort of with, with Jabba, too, in the last episode, because um, he's obviously speaking Hadith, and when he's talking, like, you don't, you don't need to hear exactly what he's saying to his son, which he apparently has, right? I think, like, that use of alien language in there mm-hmm. can be nice, too. Um, and I think this is why I like R2-D2 so much, is because, like, you never really know what he's saying. You only ever hear the people responding to him. So you can kind of put your own words into right. his mouth, I guess, into his beeps. I like the theory that's been put around that about 50% of what R2 is saying is actually hold my beer. Some <laughs> nice. variety or another. Um, or just like cursing at 3 p.m. Oh, yeah, yeah constantly. Yeah. But it's true. Yeah, I was thinking about this when you were saying about the accents earlier. Mm. There was When we met Gre- Guido, I keep wanting to call him the Italian, Guido. He's not an Italian Guido. mobster. Um, <laughs> the Roydarians make really good pizza and calzones. Oh. Um, but when he spoke English, it definitely frustrated me because he speaks this really interesting alien language in A New Hope when we're introduced mm-hmm. to him. But I know, like, this movie is aimed at kids for whom reading subtitles of alien languages is going to be difficult. Um, yeah. And so I think there's just kind of a general consensus of we're going to have everyone speak English, even though we don't quite need that. Um, and and I, I don't mind the accents because I think it helps to kind of show that they're from different parts of the universe uh, in ways, although it is... Given the associations we have with some of them, it is definitely weird. Um, was it the um, the pacifist meerkats who had the deeply Scottish accents? Yes. Yes, it yeah, was. That, those were definitely kind of hilarious. Or like Irish accents it might have been. But yeah, I like there's no plot reason for that, right? Which is why I think it's kind of weird. But at least it was internally consistent. Like every one right. of those meerkat folks spoke with the same Irish accent. And with, with now I'm going to call him Guido, with Greedo. Him having that, like, kind of rumbly, I don't know, like, squeedy almost sounding voice makes yeah. sense because he's got, like, that proboscis, so that's probably how he would sound. And this is sort of how um, other Greedo species, I know this. Oh, gosh. Because the ro- rodians. rodians. There we rodians. go. I got there. <laughs> um, uh, other rodians, like, kind of talk, but yeah. It's... I keep wanting to call their planet Rodeo. Um, <laughs> Rodeo, Rodeo. They have, they have great jewelry stores. It's great, um, <laughs> um, but even like just with uh, with like the Chuchi and then the the senator and his kids. Like the senator and his kids all had different accents, which is what bothered me. Mm-hmm. Like if it was Chuchi had like kind of an Australian accent, and the senator and his children had like a New Zealand accent, fine. But just the fact that like people in the same households have like different accents and there was really no character reason for it anyway. yeah no there, there's definitely some real weakness there <laughs> i think yeah, that, that's very like true zero and his like southern drawl um, yeah, again, which makes like, no all in sense on. for a java it makes no sense well no sense for a hut to have this like what southern drawl, but it makes so sense next, for his character oh they, the yeah, next yeah, set yeah, yeah. next week or two weeks from now we're going to be talking about a zero the hut arc and we're gonna see his uh, his hometown and mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's which is a swamp. swamp. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure, but I mean, again, like the idea of the swamps being in the South is a very Earth centric, yeah, not even yeah. Earth centric, USA centric yeah. idea. But, but yeah, it, but it's good. I don't know. It adds so much to his character, though. I don't know. It, it reminds me of. Um, I know you guys are big uh, Avatar: The Last Airbender fans, right? As of now, yeah, we just finished uh, watching it uh, oh, a nice. couple weeks ago. <laughs> the, there's a point where, I think it's in season two, I'm not sure, but they run into these swamp benders, basically. Oh, yeah. Who are this yeah, interesting yeah. mix of, like, yeah. on the one hand, they're, they, they oh, like, yeah. so much of that show is based in Asian cultures, and they look very much like they're from, like, the Southeast Asian uh, peninsula, uh, you know, like India, Cambodia, which does have quite a lot of swampland. But they talk like they're Cajun. Yeah. Like, their accent is strictly bayou, you know, mm-hmm. like... Which I kind of love, even though it's ridiculous. It is, yeah. But it was fun. I don't know. Yeah. Look, if you live in the swamp, you clearly have to make gumbo. That's just the way it goes. Um, All right. Any uh, other closing thoughts on this episode or any other episodes we saw? I think this the strength of these episodes was the difference of Mm. who we were getting. Yeah. We get Padme teamed up with Satine. No Anakin. Right, we get two episodes of Ahsoka 
no Anakin other than like hello goodbye at the beginning right. and end, <laughs> and, and and especially the Ahsoka stuff I think was very important for her continued development in this series to become yeah. her own person, to mm-hmm. become her own Jedi, and, and she succeeds in these episodes on her own for the most part. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even in um, the the academy, where like her plan gets kind of foiled, ultimately they do catch Almac. And she succeeds. And yeah, she meets up with Anakin. And he asks her, like, oh, so how was your weekend? At overthrow any tyrannical governments. She's like, oh, yeah, you know, the huge. Um, but I, I totally agree. Getting to see uh, Ahsoka as more than just Anakin's Padawan has been awesome. And then Aura Singh also. But, and then, uh, I mean, Ahsoka's in Assassins as well, existing without Anakin. Yeah, right. And being very competent, which is great. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that's super true. I think it's super true. And it, in some ways, it, it's a thing I think that being an animated show makes it much easier to do because, you know, when you have a cast of live actor live action actors and you're paying all these actors quite a lot for the season, you know, having a number of episodes where you just don't use a number of your big stars, it, that that's harder to justify. Um, but, you know, whoever's doing the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi, for that person just to not come in for a couple weeks, that's probably not as big of a deal. Um well, yeah, I, I think, think also I... if you look at the credits, a lot of the core actors like do a lot of the side voices for things. Yeah, oh, well, that's yeah, also true. Easier to get away with in an animated series, right? To your point, yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. And I think like not, I don't know. I I, li- I really like Anakin's character in Clone Wars, um, but we already get to see him so much as like this yeah. independent character. Getting to see Ahsoka growing from being so reliant on him to like. Mm-hmm. making it on her own it's great which, which yeah. is nice because there's a moment early when they're just about to part when she's being sent off on this mission when he's being sent off and she's staying back on coruscant at first mm-hmm. and as she wrote that um she she basically is very codependent with him at the start because like he's going off and she's clearly very upset at this idea that he'd go off without her and she says something about like but who will take care of you um which i thought was just a very interesting sign of like their 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 relationship needs some time apart you know she needs some time to to grow and to find herself a little bit, which she does get to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, I, I yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. They're talking about how she, she has this like weird leeway or plausibility for going to investigate with Chuchi about the disappearance of these kids, and like he he calls her snips at that point too, kind of mm. referencing this like paternalistic relationship they have, but it's it's not in a patronizing way like he usually yeah ha- or like has done in the past right it's kind of like you got this i know you got this kid i said that you like and i think he even mentions like oh i said that you have plausibility not us you're going to be doing this on your own i think but matthew is referencing in assassins oh uh, anakin gets sent off to another battle and ahsoka assumes she's going along but mace mm-hmm. tells her no you have to stay because we need your full report Oh, as right. if like you hadn't written it already. Sorry, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. There's a little bit of exposition there from from Mace that makes no sense, but you know it, it gets them apart, which I think is the interesting thing. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I thought these were some good episodes. It's a little bit of interesting world building, some interesting stuff from the characters, um, and uh, we're starting to set up for I think a, some really great runs later in the season. So I'm looking forward to to get getting to dive into that stuff. Yeah, me too. I I don't know. I really like this season. Mm-hmm. Like there is, I was I was looking through the list of episodes um, because I I don't know when you binge shows I don't know if you have the same problem like I have trouble distinguishing what is what season. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, we get like a really cool like Cad Bane arc coming up. We get a yeah we just we just get to get take some really interesting looks at, at different characters and oh yeah it's a good season yeah. it's a good season and I'm excited. Good stuff. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing where the season goes and uh, hearing all our thoughts on it. Um, and to you, the fans, what are your thoughts? Um, what would you love about these episodes? What didn't you like? What did you uh, agree with or disagree with about what we had to say? Definitely write in. Um, you can find us on Facebook under uh, Star Wars Universe Podcast. And so I realize, though, on Twitter there might be some confusion because um, the name Star Wars Universe Podcast is actually too long of a Twitter handle. And there's so much other Star Wars content out there that if you search for that, you may not find us. So the podcast official name is SWU 
for Star Wars Universe SWU podcast at Twitter. Um, the best way to find it is the link is on our um, page on the strandedpanda.com uh, podcast network. If you go there and then click on Star Wars Universe podcast, you'll find all the ways to find us. Um, please let us know what you think. The most important thing, though, is we'd love to get some reviews. Um, this is a great podcast. We've been having good conversations. We're going to do some more feedback episodes soon. Um, I'd love to get more people listening to this. And the best way to do that is for people to write reviews for us on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, uh, let us know what you think. Hopefully you can give us a five-star review and let us know what you love. But also if there's things you don't like, let us know that too. It helps us. It helps us get better. It helps the podcast grow. So please leave us a review. Please keep listening and have a great day.